talking. But what I'm going to do today, the, the title of the talk is Working with International Data. But of course, my examples of international data are primarily going to be the data that are in the World Development Indicators and in the Global Development Finance databases. Uh, just as further introduction, our publication, the World Development Indicators, looks like this this year. And it's, as you can see, a lot of statistical tables that are organized thematically around the major issues of development as the World Bank views them, what we might call our development agenda. So it covers both social indicators in a block here we call people, it covers the economy, it covers the environment, it co covers to the best we can uh, the kind of interaction between states and private markets and it also covers trade and other international flows in a section that we call global links. Uh, we use our database uh, internally because bank um, staff who are working in countries need access, ready access to data about their own countries and about other countries. We also uh, use it to produce these publications. Uh, besides the WDI and the GDF, which Jackie mentioned, I, the GDF is about the same size and I'm not hauling it around with me. We also produce an, an atlas, um, we call it now the Atlas of Global Development. And the atlas is actually the oldest publication in the World Bank, although it started out as a much simpler one. And this one now has expanded to be, you know, sort of more colorful and um, the usual atlas. It's got maps in it. Uh, tells a lot of, I think, what we would call now data stories. <clears throat> So I th suspect you can get access to both of those through your library if you're interested in looking further. What I'm going to try to do in the talk is introduce you to our database and the contents of it and then talk a little bit about um, the other work that we do to help developing countries improve the statistics that they're reporting into the international system because the quality of the data that we produce here depends um, in a significant way on the quality of data that's produced at the country level. I also will give you a couple of examples of work that the bank or the bank and its partners are doing to uh, build up the international database, the same one that we're talking about here at the WDI. But let me start here uh, with my first segment, which I've called Open Data and Its Consequences, because the World Bank underwent something of a sea change this past April uh, when the decision was made that we would henceforth make access to our databases entirely free and unrestricted. And this is, has consequences not only for us, uh, but also for some of our partners like uh, ESDS International, which I think we're all still trying to, uh, to work out um, because our previous model had been to license the, the data it primarily then went through data aggregators like ESDS or university libraries and so forth, who then made it available to their clients. But with the, and, and this is a picture of visits to our data site uh, up till April 20th. And this is a picture of what happened after we made the data available free. So obviously this spike of interest here, but you can see um, settling down around a new long-term uh, norm that's about twice as high as it had been before. So we're attracting a lot more interest. We knew that interest was always there. We don't know whether the interest is being diverted from other sources like ESDS or whether it's uh, really first time people coming in because now it's so much easier to get hold of the data. That was one of the other changes that we had to make is we had to <clears throat> rethink how we presented the data for an audience that obviously would be different once it was free. Uh, among the things we did was to translate the website into French, Spanish, and Arabic, and we're working on Russian and Chinese right now. Uh, and I'll show you some of these other things. Um, a new data catalog to make it easier to find the data that are there. Um, terms of use to sort of cover the legal issues about using and reusing data. And then many other options for accessing the data. Um, at our new website, which is data.worldbank.org, and anybody can go into that, uh, you have options for viewing country profiles. We cover 
nominally about 208 economies. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about coverage later on. Some of them are very thin, others are quite well covered. Um, some of those economies aren't even nation states. We cover territories that independently report their economic um, uh, accounts. So, for example, Isle of Man counts as an economy in the World Bank uh, database. Uh, the Channel Islands don't make it because they fail another test, which is they're just too small. And so any, any territory below 30,000 in population doesn't make it in. Uh, you can look at it by topic. We'll see that indicators, that is, you can come in and select a specific indicator. Uh, you can come to what we call the data bank, and for some, but not all of the databases we have, they're in incorporated into a data access um, mechanism, which we call the, the data bank, um, that allows you to pick and choose, slice and dice your data. And then we'll come back to the data catalog. <clears throat> so once you're in there, you can chart data by an indicator. So you can create charts like this. And all of these things can be picked up and dropped into a website, for example. So it's a sort of a widget. You can, once you've created it, you can put it into your own uh, system. Uh, you can also map. Uh, everything's in this kind of, uh, you know, continuous color tone because on advice from some of our cartographers, they felt that this was better and more useful than trying to go into this sort of, I mean, notwithstanding what our cartographers say, we get a lot more colorful in here. Well, these are charts, but this is, this is the current advice from cartographers. Um, that's an example of the Arabic site. This turned out to be the most challenging uh, piece for the developers because we're switching everything around to read from right to left introduces um, a set of programming issues that they had to wrestle with. We also created a new search tool. Um, previously, when you came to the Rollback site, if you had entered um, a term like life expectancy or even GDP, who knows what you would have gotten. You could have gone almost anywhere. You could have found almost any report that mentioned the term life expectancy, for example. Now, when you go into the search box, and if you're looking for something that's been identified as a st statistical term, it will give you a first choice that is the statistic itself. So here's an example. It pops up this little um, small graph. Uh, it assumes at the start that you're looking for the world, but then you can um, come in and, and update the chart and create a chart of anything you want. So the, the search has gotten more intelligent. We created about 2,500, 3,000 um, keywords that are a, a, a glossary of terms that people might be looking for to help guide the searches. And then um, the data catalog, which I mentioned before, I'm, I'm going to show you a little bit more of its contents in a second. Uh, here are the main databases uh, that are most commonly used by people coming into the bank's website. And these are options for getting access to them. The data bank I talked about a second ago allows you to come in and pick and choose, select indicators by year, by country, or by, by indicator name. Uh, but you can also download the whole database. If you want 50 megabytes in a zip file of, in Excel, you can, uh, you can have it. You can have it all onto your desktop. Now, I said more about the data catalog. The, the catalog is much more than just the WDI. Um, and in fact, the database is more than is in the book. But the catalog is vastly larger. And this is only selected contents of it. So a, a lot of what else you're going to find there are some specialized databases. For example, uh, the education statistics here. Uh, would have the same education indicators that are in the WDI, but would have a lot more. Basically, a complete download from the UNESCO Institute of Statistics uh, education data set. Uh, likewise, things like health, nutrition, population statistics. This would have, on top of everything else, um, project population projections out to, I believe, 2075 uh, for countries. Um, some other ones that are interesting here that I won't have a chance to talk about. Um, the worldwide governance indicators are a World Bank contribution to the effort of measuring quality of governance in countries, not just developing countries, but all countries across the world. 
somewhat controversial because almost you can almost be sure that if you're rating countries on their governance levels, somebody's going to be unhappy about their ratings. But quite interesting stuff and quite widely used. We also have another data set that's related to that called the actionable governance indicators. The reason they're not together is because even within the World Bank, there's disagreement about how one should go about measuring qualities of <coughs> governments, performance of governments, and so forth. Um, and so forth. So this is just to tell you that if you scroll down below those first five or six items in the data catalog, you may find other things you're looking at. Not all of these are as well indexed into the search function of the bank as the WDI indicators yet. So this is still something we're, we're, we're struggling with. But uh, there is a lot of information there. <clears throat> this is just a quick look at the, the data bank and how you'd search, so country by series by year. Here's an example of the kind of information that's in there. So you select the database first, and then, that, and then you can format reports and print them out. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned the, the legal issues. Uh, I don't know if anybody here is interested in that sort of thing, but the whole, um, this whole new area of open knowledge, open um, data in our case, is, is just emerging. I mean, of course, it's, it's tied up in the, the complexities of what constitute intellectual property rights and who has ownership to intellectual information. Uh, and data is a particularly complex area, although generally the rule has been that you can't claim property rights in a piece of data because that's just information. But you can copyright its amalgamation into some set or, you know, its structure, its organization, its presentation. Um, the bank, as I said, in April decided to drop all claims of uh, limitation on the use of any data that we publish. And um, that does not necessarily mean that we dropped our copyright on our particular presentation of the data. But what we did say in the terms of use is that anybody can take any part of the data, they can use it for any purpose, whether commercial or non-commercial, and the only thing we ask is that they provide attribution to the original source. That's a complex issue by itself. Again, I'm not going to have time to go into all these things, but since we are ourselves an amalgamator of data from other sources, for example, UNESCO or WHO, or um, in some cases, uh, private sources, uh, we want the attribution to go not just to us, but also to those original sources. The trouble is that there don't really exist good standards for citation of data, and the tendency is for everybody to do it their own way, and of course, in many cases, they may not even know um, what it is they're trying to cite. But I mentioned here, in case you're interested in pursuing it, that the Open Knowledge Foundation has been one of the leading um, groups in sort of pioneering this whole area of public um, access, public domain information. Our license models are similar, although the details always change, to what's recommended by the uh, Creative Commons uh, people or the Open Knowledge Foundation for a open data uh, license with attribution. Um, now, in addition to our own efforts to improve search for our data, uh, one of the uh, things we've gained by making this a truly open data set is that other people can come in and they can do things with the data themselves. One example is uh, Google. Google decided that what they would like to be able to do is similar to what we're doing internally, which is when they think that somebody is searching for a term that is, or they're actually looking for data, they'd like to be able to return an authoritative set of data to them right at the top of the search. So it's actually an exception to their, I mean, who knows what the Google uh, search algorithm really is, but this is apparently some little exceptional node that says, oh, data, we're going to go there, we're not going to go to our usual rankings. So if I type in, as I did, life expectancy China, it immediately says, oh, they must want to see the data. And so it comes back with this little box. You notice the family resemblance here. Uh, and it gives the source World Bank. Now, what I can't show you, unfortunately, because my screen capture wouldn't do it, is that if you clicked on this, Google would take you to a new page, which would allow you to 
add additional countries to a full-size graph, you can compare the trends of this indicator over time. And also off that page, if you clicked, it would take you through to the bank's data site where you could explore further. We know a lot of traffic is being driven to the bank's data site because of that uh, Google search. Uh, Microsoft, um, with its new Azure facility, is about to open up a data market that will also include all the World Bank data on it. Um, so the result is continuing demand for data. Remember my first picture, we, we had about this much of it. But you can see it's remained quite steady and it built up over here. We suspect this is because of additional publicity that happened at the time of our annual meetings and new announcements and, and also changing our website. Uh, this spike is particularly interesting. On uh, September 20th, the Los Angeles Times uh, published a story which talked about marginal tax rates, and they cited the World Bank, uh, World Development Indicators, as the source of the data on marginal tax rates around the world. Uh, that source actually is World Development Indicators, then uh, Price Waterhouse, which is where we get the data from. But people in from the LA Times um, website then just clicked on the World Bank to go see the data, and that's that spike right there, boom, just like that. Actually causes the servers to quake a little bit at the time. Uh, you can't read all of this, but uh, what I can tell you is it shows is that um, our English language data site is the most popular um, attractor to the World Bank's website of all, all possible reasons people would come to the World Bank's website. Uh, you can see it just pretty much consistently runs highest. Now the green, which in the middle of the summer went higher, is the uh, human resources job site. So people who are looking for jobs are in green, people who are looking for data are in blue. And um, then there's some other, uh, this is also data related in gold here. So you can see, and the, and the, the World Bank group as a whole is, is the red. Uh, this, this all makes us very happy because uh, it draws attention to us. It hasn't drawn a lot of new budget. Um, data sources and coverage. I want to give you a little bit of an idea of where these data come from. Uh, first of all, this is the kind of uh, very broad level topical coverage in the World Development Indicators. Now I noticed looking at the ESDS International site that you actually have done a much nicer job of bringing out a finer breakdown of what's in the databases. Uh, but I wanted to also give you kind of an idea of the numerical uh, distribution of indicators. Now this is for the WDI GDF database by itself. So a total of 1,285 indicators, you can see, with a heavy weight on economy and on social demographic areas. This would be sort of the trade, aid flows and things like that. This is debt financing um, and so forth. And the 72 listed here is across domain is basically because we, we, we take indicators and derive new indicators from them. Um, sources of data, <clears throat> I said a moment ago, uh, that we're big borrowers from other people. So uh, this is kind of the breakdown uh, that I see when I look at the source information we provide. So about 45% uh, of the data originate with the World Bank. This is a little bit misleading perhaps because there may be things that are attributed here to the World Bank that, again, we have taken from other places but we've manipulated to such a degree that we feel we have to take responsibility of when we call that the World Bank. But this would also be true of some of our partners who are using some of our data, for example, in order to construct their indicators that then come back to us. So it's a, it's a very large uh, network of data exchange that's going on out there in the world. Uh, so second place here is UNESCO uh, because we have so many um, education indicators in the data set. And then IMF, our uh, sister organization across the street from which we get a lot of uh, financial and government um, finance data. Now this accounts for 1,635 indicators with identified sources. So not all of these are in the WDI database. Some of these are being used in the other databases that I showed you when we looked at the data catalog. But at least uh, some sense of where uh, this all comes from. I talked about coverage a moment ago. Uh, this is kind of the, the downside. Um, so we have 237 countries in the database. Uh, now some of these are countries that are now defunct, like former Yugoslavia, 
uh, former East Germany and so forth, former Soviet Union. Uh, I think I said 208, and maybe now 210 that we have as active uh, countries in the database. Um, 158 series, I'm not even sure where that number came from, but uh, it's, it, it's the trouble is you take account at any time you get a different answer. Uh, we, we try to cover 50 years of data, but many series don't begin uh, that far back. Uh, so when we get to average coverage, we calculate, you know, here that there are 4,453, 206 million possible observations, and even that doesn't make much, yeah, I guess that does work out. Seven times eight is kind of six. Um, but the number that actually have a data point in them is about uh, 14 million. So we have roughly a third of the data cells filled. Anytime you come in, you know, a random selection, you're going to get two thirds blanks and one third with data. Uh, there are a lot of reasons for that. <clears throat> one of them is that uh, for the states of the former Soviet Union, now separate, you know, the Commonwealth of Independent States and the Baltic States, uh, most of the data doesn't exist before 1988. We have some series, like population, that go back farther, but we couldn't reconstruct economic accounts and so forth uh, before that. Same with uh, Yugoslavia. Uh, we have limited reporting for many of these small states and dependencies that I mentioned before. <clears throat> and then we have a lot of data that come from irregular or ir infrequent sources. Um, the kinds of surveys, for example, that are used to do poverty estimation simply aren't done every year. And in some countries they may occur only once in five years or even ten years <clears throat> time, and in some countries have never been done. So real limitation on those kinds of measurements. Malnutrition, likewise, is done very selectively. Uh, the, the kinds of surveys that produce information that can be compared across countries are generally done only in countries where malnutrition is known to be a problem in the first place, so we don't have good references for, um, particularly for wealthier countries. CO2 emissions are done on a regular basis, but only about every four years, generally speaking. Same way with things like forest coverage. Many of the FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization, data are reported on a, you know, a, a longer term cycle. So that accounts for a lot of the, the gaps. Plus the fact that simply some of these series weren't even being collected 30 or 40 years ago. This is a picture, and th this, is, this is just economic indicators. But to give you some sense of the improvements that have occurred in data coverage, it takes a moment to explain this. But So this is data coverage in the WDI 2009, and this is data coverage in um, 10 years ago in the 1999 version of the WDI. And what it's showing you is um, the average number of years for which there were data by five-year blocks going backwards. So you see up here we're at you know like 4.8 or something uh, years of data. So essentially what it's telling you is that um, something like 96 percent of the countries had data um, in the five-year period, the most recent five-year period. Or actually it's not just the countries. If you thought of that as a square country or rectangle countries by five years, 96% of those squares would be filled. As you go farther back, so now if we start going back 40 years and ask, well, what was the coverage in our current database? What is the coverage in our current database 40 years back? It falls well off. So now we're down to about 60% of the cells are filled. But what we can also see here is that compared to where we were 10 years ago, we're actually doing better. We've, we've managed to pick up, reconstruct some historical data, and our current year coverage is better than it was 10 years ago. So, you know, there is work going on year by year to improve the international database. Uh, this is another view of that same kind of question. Um, this might be too complicated to explain here, but uh, get, we were particularly interested because we monitor closely the Millennium Development Goal indicators. Everybody here recognizes Millennium Development Goals as a concept? So these are mostly social indicators as opposed to the economic indicators before. And what we were interested in is um, whether countries had at least two data points, because 
we're interested in trends. All the, the Millennium Development Goals are all stated in terms of achieving a target at the end of a period of time. So we need to know what has been the trend since the beginning. Um, and then nominal benchmark for the MDGs is 1990. So we asked um, how many countries had at least two data points. So uh, we've got 31 countries in July that had, uh, uh, there were only zero, sorry, let's see, number of indicators, sorry, start over again. Apologies to the camera. Um, <laughs> indicators, in other words, an indicator like the poverty measurement, the proportion of children enrolled in primary school, under five child mortality, maternal mortality, things of that sort. How many indicators, how many countries did we have <laughs> had at least five, or zero to five indicators with at least two data points? So 31 and so forth. And I, if I say this too often, I'll just get into a complete jumble. Uh, so here what we see happening between July 2003 and July 2009 is that we have fewer countries in this low range where they only have a few indicators with two data points and more countries in the high range where they have many more indicators now have two data points. So we're up to 72% of the countries are in this range up here. So again, through a lot of work in the countries and by the international agencies that work in these databases, we've seen improvements. So now I want to talk a little bit about what we're doing to improve um, statistical capacity, because this is really a core piece of our work. And the development data group um, that Jackie mentioned is itself divided into two halves. I was the manager of the portion that did all of this, and the reporting on the Millennium Development Goals and a lot of the interaction with the other agencies. And the other half of the department works on statistical capacity building. That's a simplified version. Not, no, no bureaucratic organization is ever as simple as that, but that's a pretty good version of it. So first of all, when we look at the world, how do we see the quality of the statistical systems? And what I should say here is that for the most part, what we're talking about in the WDI, and I'm talking about now, are official statistics, statistics that come through the government, through designated agencies of the government, who have a mandate to approve, to produce the official statistics for that country. So those would be national statistical offices, or uh, sectoral ministries like Ministry of Education, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Labor, all of whom have uh, specific responsibilities in reporting these data. And they generally report them upwards to the specialized agencies of the UN that have that parallel mandate, the International Labor Organization, World Health Organization, UNESCO, the World Bank in the case of debt data, for example, uh, IMF in the case of balance of payments data. So, We've come up with an index which we use to rate the overall uh, capacity of the countries, and I'll explain in a moment what's in that rating. And so the low end is red. You can see uh, you know, the Democratic Republic of Congo uh, is, is one of those uh, in dark red. Uh, a couple of uh, states of the former Soviet Union, uh, Iraq, um, and then on up to the the, the higher levels. We are, haven't evaluated the uh, high income countries of North America, Europe, uh, Australia, uh, New Zealand, and so forth. Uh, so all this is, this is no data uh, here, that, that blue color. Uh, it might be just a, a moment to say that the World Bank looks at the world divided two ways, one by income and the other by region. And it sometimes leads to confusion because we, we do both. So we have high income group, which are basically, well, many of the ones you see in gray here, although not, uh, Saudi Arabia is also here. Um, uh, uh, Western Sahara, Sahara is, is not a high income country. It's just, there is no information about it. <laughs> <laughs> the same thing with here, with this is a French Guiana, I guess. Um, so we see the world that way. And we see high income countries as being sort of homogeneous, whether they're here or here. And then we divide the rest of the developing world as to low income and middle income and by region. So Latin America and the Caribbean, Sub Saharan Africa here, Middle East and North Africa across here, but excluding uh, Saudi Arabia because they're high income, South Asia, 
East Asia and the Pacific over here, excluding Korea and Japan and things like uh, Brunei, they're all high income. Uh, so keep that in mind when you're using our data. Um, so statistical capacity, just very quickly, we um, look at three dimensions of the performance of statistical systems. The methodologies they're using, for example, um, have they um, kept their uh, national accounts up to date and are they using the most recent version of the national accounts, uh, balance of payments and so forth? Are they, uh, how are they reporting uh, vaccinations to WHO, enrollment reporting and so forth? Uh, second, we look at the kind of sources for their data as well. In this case, for example, asking have they done a census within the last 10 years and uh, periodicities of some of their other um, uh, surveys and census work, uh, health-related surveys. And th these are our standards. So you know, if, you're, if you haven't done a census in 10 years or uh, you're, uh, if you've done it in less, sorry, if you have done a census in, within the last 10 years, you're a one. If you're less than that, you're maybe a half or a zero and so forth. And then finally, um, periodicity of reporting. Um, so how often are they able to report some of these indicators? And these get all normalized and mashed up and added together to produce the final score. I don't think I, yeah, no, I should have included the website here, but in the data catalog that I showed you earlier, there is an entry for the statistical capacity bulletin board. And if you go there, you can get the details for every country. You can get a much fuller explanation of what each of these items means and how they're scored, and, and more information about our, our work on building that uh, statistical capacity. It's interesting to take that index, for example, and look at it correlated with other uh, development indicators. You find a lot of connections. So what are we doing about it? Um, the bank is one of a number of organizations that are involved in helping countries improve their statistical systems. Uh, but we have, uh, over the last 10 years, really been the leading agency in doing that with support from many of our friends. Uh, the support has come through allowing us to establish trust funds that we can use to finance uh, projects in countries. Uh, the trust fund for statistical capacity was one of the first. And it was largely used, um, but not exclusively, to help countries create plans for their statistical systems. So what we call an NSDS, a National Strategy for the Development of Statistics. The idea being that countries really needed to evaluate their own statistical systems and say what it was they wanted to do with them before donors could come in and engage in a discussion about how they would support them. Uh, <clears throat> following on to that, we began, uh, we opened up the Statistics for Results Facility, which is another multi-donor trust fund. Uh, we now have $120 million <coughs> pledged to that trust fund with about $50 million committed, and I should tell you that a very large chunk of that commitment is coming from the Department for International Development in the UK. And DIF has been a, a big, big backer of improving statistics in developing countries for at least the last decade. Um, Claire Short gave a very uh, well-remembered amongst those you know, devotees um, speech um, 11 years ago at a meeting in Paris where we established a consortium of <clears throat> agencies that are interested in supporting improvements in statistical capacity, which is called the Partnership in Statistics for the 21st Century, but uh, abbreviated nicely to Paris 21. So if you Google Paris 21, for example, it's a good way to start finding out more about <clears throat> what's being done collectively to improve uh, statistical capacity in the world. Uh, we also have a, an investment program in the bank where countries can borrow to, for large-scale uh, projects of uh, <coughs> statistical capacity. Uh, there are 13 projects planned or underway. The largest, I'm missing a parenthesis, which just um, became operational uh, a few months ago, is in India, $107 million that India is borrowing to put into their <coughs> state 
statistical operations. So there'll be programs in almost all of the Indian states. Uh, a couple other things that we're doing uh, that don't involve sort of transferring money so much as transfer, uh, transferring information and ideas. One is the accelerated data program. I'll just tell you in the briefest terms that this is aimed at improving the execution and archiving and use of um, micro uh, data, that is to say household surveys, primarily although equally firm level surveys or other kinds of survey um, instruments. And uh, what we have observed for many, many years is that uh, surveys get carried out and then um, you know, the, the results hopefully get tabulated uh, and then they generally get forgotten and they, they can't be uh, reused because they exist only in paper formats or because most of the documentation has been lost along the way. So the ADP is an effort both to recover those surveys where they can be recovered bring them into an electronic format along both the data and the metadata, <clears throat> and also to teach new practices for the management of microdata and to bring in international standards, um, particularly the uh, DDI standard for uh, um, data documentation. And we've developed a series of tools and toolkits uh, that can be used as well as training programs for developing countries in that. And then related, and I have some brochures that some of you have them, on the virtual statistical system. I need a sip of water. And this is an effort to create a portal where anyone managing a statistical system or anyone who is advising a statistical system on how to manage itself can go to get resources, um, various documents, uh, recommended practices, examples, that sort of thing. Uh, are all accessible uh, through the virtual statistical system. The concept was basically a big electronic library where you could go and find the information you needed specifically on how to uh, manage a national statistical office. That was just launched um, a month ago, and you can find it on the web. The web address is on the brochure that got handed out. It's virtual statistic www.virtualstatisticalsystem.org so moving on and the theme here was what are we doing to improve the international database so building capacity at the country level is one of those things uh, but we also do a certain amount of manipulation of the data after it's been collected in the countries this is going to be one example of that having to do with estimates of child mortality, um, but it's similar to what is also being done currently to derive estimates, for example, maternal mortality, also access to water and sanitation. All of these data arise from survey instruments or from vital statistics systems. And one of the problems that we face is that, uh, as I mentioned before, Many of the surveys are not carried out on a regular basis. Uh, furthermore, by the nature of surveys, they don't all return the same result. And in particular, when you're trying to estimate uh, child or mortality statistics from surveys, you typically get estimates that span a range of years but have uh, differing levels of reliability. So uh, this is uh, what I'm showing you is a website here that's maintained by WHO. but the World Bank and the UN POP division all collaborate on these estimates. And here's a picture of, of sort of what the data looks like going in. These are all surveys conducted in Bangladesh, which actually has quite a good statistical system, uh, on estimates of under five child mortality. And you can see there are lots of them, and they have lots of divergences, although they're getting a little closer. Well, of course, there are fewer of them as we go down here. Um, there are reasons uh, for these differences, and one of them is that they're not, the surveys themselves are not the same. Uh, in some cases, we may be reporting vital registration data as well as survey data. Uh, so the first step is to agree on a method of bringing them together. And, and what's done then is a, 
a weighted regression in the sense that weights are attached to surveys a priori based upon what is believed to be their reliability. And some may get a weight of zero in, in these results. And then they're splined in, in such a way as to best fit the underlying data. So we have a trend line now. And the data off of this trend line are what we're reporting in the WDI. We're not reporting all these other results. That also creates a kind of spurious continuity to the data. You can get year-by-year -year data for child mortality, even though, well, in the case of Bangladesh, we obviously have a lot of reporting. But in other countries, whoops, what happened here? Oh, we'll get to the other countries. What we can also get out of those regressions is some measure of the reliability. And you know, typically in, in a regression, the more information you have, the more reliable. So the air bands are fairly narrow in here, and they spread out towards the ends where they're larger, uh, where there are large divergences or towards the end of the regression. Line. But that's a very useful piece of information to know. I was going to say, in countries where there are fewer surveys, there may be a much bigger gap between what we report as child mortality and what the countries themselves report. So, as you can see, in this case for Belarus, there's, there's really a substantial divergence with these surveys being for sources of data. I'm not sure what they all are. Well, here we are. So this is Belarus's vital registration system. This is a, from the Belarus census of 1999, and so forth. Um, this is what we believe to be the closest approximation to what's really going on there. Of course, what happens when we report you know, this number, and Belarus reports this number, is that we, we get complaints from the country or sometimes from other researchers. Why is this number this way, and why is it not the other way? I mean, in rough terms, that, that's the answer to, to those differences. It does often put our country staff uh, in a difficult position because on the one hand when they're negotiating with countries over programs and projects the tendency is to use the country data but when we're looking across a group of countries we'd like to use the data that's most comparable um, across country and then i want to talk just a moment about the international comparison program um, which is and again another example of the work we're doing to increase statistical information in the global data set. And I do have a few brochures here, not enough to go around about the ICP, but if you want to pick one up afterwards, you're, you're certainly welcome to do that. The International Comparison Program, does this mean anything to you? Or does purchasing power parity mean anything to people in this room? Some people, yes. Okay, so the International Comparison Program, which has been operating now for 20 or 25 years, uh, with World Bank participating in different ways at different times, is a global program to measure price levels across countries in order to drive a, a cross-country price index that you can think of as being uh, similar in concept to a uh, within-country price index over time. Uh, it allows real comparisons of income or output between countries in the same way that a price index over time allows us to make a real comparison between income or output in, let's say, 2009 and 1999 or 1909. Uh, this happens to be the page out of the data catalog. If you click on ICP, it gives you the basic metadata about the ICP program. Uh, I think I just said what's on this slide. Uh, so PPPs are an alternative to market exchange rates in that if we convert country um, output values to a common currency using market exchange rates, we'll get one answer, which you can think of as being the nominal value. But if we use PPPs, we will generally get a different answer because PPPs take into account the differences between the price levels in countries in a way that exchange rates, in theory, if you read sort of, you know, it's, it's the simple theory, ought to, but rarely do. And there are, of course, many reasons why exchange rates will not exactly uh, compensate for differences in price levels between countries. Um, so 
a PPP between two countries, A and B, is a price ratio that compares how much you can buy in one current country's currency with the, or sorry, the cost of buying something in one country's currency with the cost of buying exactly the same thing in another country's currency. The popular example of this, if you read The Economist, is the Economist Big Mac Index, where they compare prices of Big Macs across hundreds of countries. And of course, part of their argument is that Big Mac is a very standardized product. So you buy it in one country or another country, you're getting the same product. And they go on further, but a little more dubiously to argue, it also sort of is a, um, a product that brings together many different um, elements of the economy. You know, so there's service labor included in it, there's agricultural production in it, there's other kinds of manufacturing. So it's a representative product in some way. Um, it's, it's at least fun to look at. Uh, for the ICP, we go out and collect um, annual prices for products that are uh, chosen from a, 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 a large a large sampling. Over a thousand different products are included. And we then um, use those to develop price indices to correspond to 155 uh, categories uh, within the national accounts. The weighting, if you, if you know much about constructing price indices, then we get the prices by doing these comparisons of goods. Uh, and, and there's a whole, it's like a telephone book uh, that's the guide to the goods. It looks like a shopping catalog, you know, and you, you, the pictures. And so people who are working in the field can say, this is what I'm looking to find. You know, there's a picture of a five kilo bag of rice, unbroken, da 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 da. And all the other information that's needed to try to uh, ensure that what they're looking at, you know, in Vietnam is the same as what they're looking at in um, the UK when they're pricing. And then um, the weights, so that's the prices, and then the weights that you need in the price index are taken from expenditures in the national accounts of each country. So here's a numerical example. So if we, this is hotel rooms, okay, at the current exchange rate, so this is China, um, Yuan, um, the price of a hotel room in the United States uh, would be 1,800 yuan in China. But when we compare on a PPP, so this is the exchange rate, right? So they're six point something yuan to the dollar. The yuan's worth 15 cents. But when we look on a price level comparison, because prices tend to be lower in China, Basically, a yuan will buy tw what, what 25 cents will buy in the United States. So if you, 15 cents doesn't buy you so much, but 25 cents buys you more. So the value of that same 1800 yuan uh, hotel room in China is actually more like what you'd pay 450 for if you were trying to get a hotel room in the United States. That's the concept. One of the things that that does is it causes significant upward revision in the GDP measurements for uh, most developing countries. Uh, here, again, you remember I said the World Bank looks at things through this kind of income dimension. Though this is only income now. We're not looking at regions. Um, but what we're comparing here are, for example, the colors translate rather strangely. But let's see if I can get this. <laughs> let's find low income. So this is low income uh, countries altogether. Their average GNI, gross national income per capita, over time from 1990 forward. And you can see that the rise there. This is in real terms. And then we want to look for low income countries on a PPP basis. That's up here. Uh, the coloring is unfortunate. Of course, that should really be solid blue and it would be easier to see. So you can see that when we measure on a PPP basis, their GNI per capita goes from something around 700 to something closer to 1,100 in comparative terms. Now, you don't get the same change when we look at the high-income countries. Why? Uh, well, first of all, because <coughs> they are, uh, their <coughs> economies are exchanging much more. They're doing a lot of trading. And so traded good prices tend to then equilibrate between them. And in general, because their incomes are um, all rather more closely matched, 
their price levels also tend to be more closely matched than in low-income countries. How this makes a difference, you can see here. So 1990 GDP by exchange rates, this is global output now, and we attribute 83% of that to high-income countries. When we looked in 1990 by PPPs, so exchange rates PPPs, that attribution drops to 66%. So the share of global output that we see coming from high-income countries actually falls, or it might be fair to say the share that should be attributed to low- and middle-income countries rises from 17% here to 34% there, so it doubles. And when we go to 2008, it's a similar story. Now we see the real growth of the economies. Again, even by exchange rate terms, developing countries are producing more and more of global output. So it's up to almost 25% here. And when we look on PPP terms, you can see it's over 40%. So it makes a big difference in how we think about the world, whether we use exchange rates or PPPs. And there is a separate database in the WDI data catalog with just the detailed results from the last round of purchasing power parity estimates. Uh, those surveys were carried out benchmarked to 2005. The next round is getting underway uh, this coming year, 2011. And I'm sorry to say that given the, just the, the amount of, the volume of work that's entailed in all this, uh, results won't be published till 2013. In the meanwhile, what we continue to do, and for the data that appear in the WDI, is extrapolate forward um, based upon relationships between price level and countries' levels of income. Oh, uh, uses of PPPs. Um, too many to, to, to mention, but one of the most important from the point of view of the World Bank is it allows us to make cross-country comparisons of poverty levels. And so the, the World Bank's uh, dollar a day poverty standard, which is actually now pitched at a dollar twenty-five a day per person, as our standard for extreme poverty, is based upon PPP conversions. Because again, when we talk about a common value in dollars across countries, or you know, if we could talk about it in pounds or in rupees, we need to know that the purchasing power of those dollars is the same in every country when we're making the comparison. Otherwise, it makes no sense to try to compare poverty levels from one country to the next. But there are a lot of other uses of them. Um, within Europe, uh, actually, the um, European um, Union does a lot more work with PPPs than even we do because they're used for the um, allocation of um, the structural and cohesion funds uh, by the EC. And Finally, I want to just talk a little bit about tools and applications to go with the data. One of the areas that we're now you know, thinking much more about is what does it take to use these data? How, how, how can people better visualize them, analyze them, or in some cases uh, collect them uh, themselves? And this is just a listing of some of the um, tools that we've developed at the World Bank um, for use with the data. Of course, open data is what we've been talking about. Uh, NADA is a set of tools for accessing uh, and documenting uh, microsurveys. Uh, the other things I don't, suppose I don't need to read for you, but um, this is an interesting one. Uh, all of these are accessible off the bank's website. Uh, and can be, and they provide different kinds of services. So it's, it's some basically just help cough up a number for you. For example, PodCalcNet you can use to ask for poverty numbers in countries or ask, uh, ask it to aggregate across groups of countries. Uh, PodMap at the moment will show you the geogra uh, geo geographical location of bank projects and allow you to look at that against some um, subnational data, so you can sort of see bank health projects against um, uh, child health indicators or something for selected countries, and so on down here. This one, WITS, maybe should have had a special uh, note by it. WITS is actually a very large uh, data system, again, accessible through the data catalog that allows you to manipulate um, a vast amount of trade 
data. Right? So you can, I mean, there are literally billions of items that record trade at a very detailed level between countries over time. And WIX uh, allows you to look at that. It also has tariff information in it. So oh, I pointed at the wrong thing. Pop, this is mapping for results. These are bank projects. Pop map is software for uh, doing what we call poverty mapping, small area estimates. So it allows you to take a, a, a national poverty survey and then um, break it down to smaller units using correlations with census and other data uh, to, to produce small area estimates. And in that vein, we are sponsoring an Apps for Development competition. You, there was a card that went around about it. I also have a few posters if anybody wants to take it and post it uh, in, a, in a public place. Probably isn't going to win awards for you know, art on the wall. But uh, the idea with the Apps for Development competition, and you're all welcome to think about um, entering it, is to create um, some motivation for developers, that is to say, people who build computer systems, and development specialists, that is to say, people who are concerned with economic development, and we, we keep stumbling over the same word, develop, um, to get together and think about what can I see or show or how can I improve the way in which we use these data. The requirement for this particular competition, which was opened a month ago, on the 7th of October, and closes on the 10th of January is that it must use some data from the World Bank, but it can also bring in data from any other source. And it must address some issue uh, that's relevant to the Millennium Development Goals. So, you know, poverty, education, gender, health, um, trade, aid flows, it's, it's a vast area. The environment in general all potentially fit under this. And, as I say, bring together developers and development practitioners. Um, and by, again, going on our website, there's an you know, address. You can find out more about the details of, of entering the competition. And I just conclude with, with this slide, which I borrowed from another presentation, and it's uh, perhaps too wordy. Our president, Bob Zolik, has become very enthusiastic about this whole kind of new uh, potential of, of information to drive development. And uh, this is his dream, um, essentially of somebody accessing data on a handheld device in real time in order to make a decision that matters to her or her family you know, at the ground level. We're still a long ways uh, from being there, but you know, the new possibilities are opening up all the time. So I will... I guess I'll leave you with that. That's the end of my talk. And I'll be happy to answer questions. I didn't give you much chance to break in and ask me anything as I went along, but anything right from the beginning through the end, I'm happy to talk about. Yes? Just to clarify, what are the restrictions now on the commercial use of World Bank data? No, no restrictions at all. You can take it, and then if you can think of a clever product to make out of it and sell it, you're welcome to do it. But just using it, there's no restriction on that? No restriction at all on using it. And uh, it's probably sounds very ungrateful, but are there any moves towards um, on national accounts in the WBI uh, towards reporting data? Is that, is that on, the, on the radar? Um, well, of course, it's not the WBI that determines that. It's country production of national of quarterly data. Um, the answer is yes, we would like to move in that direction. We haven't had enough to make it worthwhile to try to to incorporate that into the, uh, particularly into the data bank. But I think within the next couple of years, you're going to see more of that. And if you need quarterly data, um, in many cases, you, you for specific countries that produce it, you could get it off of their websites. Um, another place to find out who's doing quarterly data is that the funds um, data dissemination bulletin board, a data dissemination standards bulletin board, um, tells you which countries are producing quarterly data at the moment. So the, the Asian Development Bank published some data on national accounts. So they're, they're, yeah. the they're starting to, yeah. 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 So 
Um, well, I'm glad you brought up. I'll, I'll go back and remind my macroacademic team that this is something that's that's uh, needs to come along. So just one final one. You yeah. mentioned PPPs. Yeah. Uh, are there any, is there any um, in that international comparison program? Are there going to be any sectoral PPPs? The, the, the basket, of, what, the price of the goods, the price of the basket of goods is across. Yeah. A consumer basket. The, in, in terms of uh, trade competitiveness, is there any attempt to look at maybe different sectors in the output side and where? There, there is, and in fact, the the 2005 report, which was published in 2007, which you can find on our website, um, does give broad sectoral breakdowns for things like education, health, uh, about 15 breakdowns within the national account structure, uh, mostly on the consumption side. The trouble with those is that we, we haven't had a reliable way of extrapolating them forward. So we've got the 2005 benchmarks, but we haven't tried to carry those forward year by year, but you know, you certainly can, I think, in fact, I think that they're all in that database that I mentioned is the PPP database online. So you can, you can look at those and see if they, they're useful. Yeah. Yes, please. Um, could you oh, sorry. Excuse me, just before you ask your question, would you mind just identifying your name and your role and which part of the university? Yeah, um, that would be helpful. Uh, yeah, um, Adela, and I'm um, in the um, uh, Development Economics and Public Policy um, mm -hmm. Australia. Um, I, I'd like to know, I, I've used some of your data for some of my PhD studies, mm -hmm. and I wanted to know if there's a way to uh, suggest um, other uh, indicators or something that could be useful uh -huh. for our researchers. I mean, on your website or what? which is the way, because we were like researching a very curious argument, let's say, instead of researching on poverty, we were researching on social exclusion, mm -hmm. and there you have maybe some um, strange data that are seen useful, like, I don't know, uh, kilometers of electricity cables in a country mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. like that, mm -hmm. that it's not exactly in a, from an economical point of view, let's say. Mm -hmm. So is there any way to interact with you saying, I was studying this and I think it would be useful if you collect or if you create a database about well, the, the, the two straightforward ways are, you'll see on our website there is a place where you can offer feedback or you can at any time send an email to data at worldbank.org which goes to the what we call our client services team which are actually two people who are there full time to answer questions but also receive those kinds of suggestions and in some cases they may be able to also help you by directing you to a source of it even though it's not in the WDI. So data at worldbank.org and they're really very good about responding to everything that comes in. It's not just a you know sort of a, a basin that things fall into and never come out of. And they're also good at chasing down people on the team who have detailed knowledge. And if you find flaws or mistakes or just odd uh, odd odd debris in the data uh, we also like to get informed about that. Yeah. Yes. Uh, my name is Thomas Kome. I'm like uh, taking PPM, uh, public policy and management. Uh, about the uh, statistical capacity, um, mm -hmm. I found out like some of the countries this dictatorship uh, shows relatively high capacity uh, mm -hmm. uh, in the map. So, mm -hmm. what are the factors you can? Um, gee, I don't know if I have a good answer. I mean, one thing that we observe, broadly speaking, is that um, statistical capacity is not just related to the abilities of statisticians to produce statistics, but it's also related to the interest in using statistics. So we, we always talk about the supply of statistics and the demand for statistics. and uh, if you don't, you can have a lot of potential supply, but if there's no demand, it just doesn't come out. We also observe that in many countries, statistics falls to sort of the, the bottom. It's a discretionary expenditure. Only if you're doing fairly well do you spend much money on your statistical systems. Now, whether that's correlated with you know, 
autocratic governments or democratic governments and so forth, I'm not so sure. I think that one can argue meaningfully that statistics is a um, sign of the quality of governance in the countries, that countries that um, are well managed, whether or not they're you know, sort of democratic or autocratic, have produced better statistics because they need them in order to uh, do a better job of running the country. Yes. Yeah, I'm Stephen Mahdi from uh, Development Economist Policy, mm -hmm. and um, I'm from Liberia. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed the uh, presentation. Mm -hmm. One thing that really came to my mind was the fact that uh, when I was back home, and we're doing the uh, Millennium Development Goal Report uh, 2009, 2008, uh -huh. we had some inconsistency with the folks at the UNDP, because uh -huh. there was always the issue of data uh, harmony and wild view. So when you talk about Bangladesh and how when you report the XYZ data mm -hmm. and they had contention with your data, yeah. I thought about us as a students, how do we really proceed in terms of reporting data harmony because you're going to have instances where you may have data from the UNDP, from the World Bank, mm -hmm. and they always have a report data that uh, may have come from your folks in, in, in the country, in that country, mm -hmm. and the country may have contention. <laughs> so, what sort of advice do you have for us so that I should proceed with our research work with the other people who how many in our data sets? Well, the first, the easy part of that is to say, if you're doing comparative work, you want to look at Liberia and other countries in West Africa or elsewhere in the world, then you probably need to go to a source that has invested time in um, harmonizing across countries and used common standards across countries. If you're working exclusively within Liberia, then you may want to use the data that's produced in Liberia. Now, the exception to that is, of course, still depends a bit on the, the quality of the data itself. In some cases, the differences between the national and the international estimates are more, um, have to do more with um, convention. For example, um, the um, UNESCO standardizes education statistics according to their classification of education. And so they'll look at a country and they'll say, well, in this country, the first four grades of school correspond to what we consider to be the primary education level. In another country, it might be five years. Uh, so then they, they standardize all of that so that when we talk about primary school in one country, it's the same as in another country. But if you're just working within a country, it, that doesn't make any difference to you at all. You're just interested in, you know, progression from grades 1 through 12. So you might as well have used the national statistics. But then when you get into other areas, it can be a bit trickier um, in terms of whether the, the, the way in which the statistics are compiled at the national level, whether they sort of live up to the recommended standards for measuring things like mortality rates or other uh, characteristics. And I think there is when, if you're you know, doing empirical research that really where the results depend upon the data, you really need to invest a little bit of time in understanding better how are those data constructed so you can take that into account in your analysis. That's, there's no general rule though for that one. <clears throat> yes, please. Um, I am passing from the English in public policy and management. And from Peru, I'm passing from My question is related to the governance. Mm -hmm. uh, it's related to the, the way you pick the information up because these government governance indicators of these people were not so, so common in the national mm -hmm. organizations, no. but in the non governmental organizations. So I, I well, you know, broadly speaking, governance ind indicators come in two flavors. You have subjective measures, which are usually assessments that are provided by somebody or maybe through a survey, a collection of bodies who report on their perceptions. Another word for it is perception indicators. And you know, how free is a country, how open is uh, the press, and things like that. There aren't good um, objective measures for that. And that's usually the complaint, of course, is that Perception depends a lot on the person reporting as much as on what's being perceived. Uh, 
the worldwide governance indicators that I mentioned first are all derived from perception-based indicators, but their specific twist is that they take a very large number of these from the many, 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 many sources, and then through statistical manipulation of them, try to find the core common characteristics of all of those. Uh, so the result has been what turns out to be a fairly reliable uh, set of indicators, but they're all, none of these are reported by governments themselves. Now when you get to the sort of um, uh, actionable governance indicators, they can take a lot of different forms. Um, but just as one example, maybe if you're concerned about the uh, judicial system and you know, an important indicator for that would be backlogs in courts or how long does it take to resolve a legal dispute. Now, the tricky thing is that's measurable and it's also actionable in the sense that a country who decided that they wanted to improve this probably can take direct steps to improve it. So nevertheless, the interpretation of it um, in terms of sort of saying what does this tell us about the quality of governance in the country is still somewhat subjective. It's not as if it just rings out and says, you know, this is good governance and this is bad governance. There may be complicated reasons why it takes longer, more, more or less time to do this. But that's the difference between these two. And um, so there are probably indicators, they may not even be identified as governance indicators, but which exist in many countries that, that can be used to help understand uh, you know, the processes that are there. Yes? Well, I guess I'd have to say we stick to a statistical approach um, on that specific issue of uh, accounting, accounting for own production. Surveys, well-designed surveys to measure household income and expenditure should capture that. In other words, when you go out to do a survey on a family, these are always household-based, right? Families' uh, income and their expenditures, you want to know sort of wage income. You also want to know how much they produce and what was the value of what they produced themselves and how much of what they produced consumed. It's one of the reasons that doing those surveys is so complicated and expensive and why they don't happen often. And of course, some don't do it better than others. But in the end, you should have a picture of both the market and non-market-based activities in the uh, family. Now, that could, should, give you a pretty good picture of income poverty. The, the question that usually comes up, and I'm not sure what you mean by structuralist approach, is that there are other sort of elements of poverty. Uh, one was mentioned here a moment ago, social exclusion. Some, somebody belonged to a group that, uh, regardless of their income, is somehow deprived of you know, other goods that we would consider to be important for a, a full life, whether that's you know access to education itself, or um, you know ability to um, move where they want to, things of that sort. And then there's just sort of overall questions of good health. I mean, on the one hand, income will help you achieve better health, but you can have people who are poor and healthy, and people who are poor and unhealthy. How do you factor that in when you're considering the kind of overall poverty picture? Now, recently, and you may have heard, there has been a discussion going on uh, because the Oxford Poverty, um, OPMI, what's the M? <laughs> it's, not, it's not management. Um, anyway, uh, in, in, in Oxford, has put together what they call multidimensional poverty measure. And they, they took some of these other non-monetary characteristics and you know, much the same way I was talking about with our uh, capacity 
in the data, kind of, you know, weighted them and averaged them and combined them and normalized them. The problem with that approach that you get into, and this is true of any index number that you construct, is that the weights matter a whole lot. And in fact, the weights implicitly create trade-offs between these dimensions. So if I give a weight of 30% income and 30% to education and 40% to health, I'm effectively saying that I believe that you know, there's kind of an exchange rate between uh, education and health. And so if a person becomes a little bit healthier, uh, but a little less well-educated, of course, that can't be an individual, but as a group, and their poverty level remains the same, I should not be unhappy. But that doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, so every effort that I'm aware of to create these kind of multi-dimensional indexes runs afoul of that problem. And so what are you really trading off? This is true, for example, of the much better known now uh, human development uh, index. The human development report people are also involved with the Oxford Poverty um, Multidimensional Indicator. <clears throat> it's the same thing in the human development index. Implicitly, you're you're sort of saying, well, a country can be higher on the human development scale if it raises its um, school attendance rate, even though maybe its life expectancy falls a little bit because it went up enough on education to adjust for the, the drop in life expectancy. Well, there's kind of a moral problem <laughs> when you're making those trade-offs. Anyway, um, so the bank, for the most part, is stuck with kind of what we can measure. In this case, we can measure income. Well, I think we've probably worn everybody out. Uh, do, do we have any final questions for Eric? Okay. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. My name is Mustafa Eric. Mm -hmm. uh, this is called I'm doing a good conversation. Mobile microfinance in Egypt, especially. Uh -huh. uh, so I'm asking if you sponsor some primary researchers in the developing countries. Because we know most of us have specific scholarships, mm -hmm. which is limited uh, in terms of monetary and financial support. So if you can help to some uh, researchers collecting species of micro data, mm -hmm. uh, I think you'll find many students, spe especially MBS and in Manchester, in general. Yeah, unfortunately, we. We don't do a lot of that directly. If we did, it would go through the country itself. That is to say that they would have, they would use funding that they obtained from the World Bank to do that kind of you know, bursarships or whatever that they um, were interested in doing. There, but if you look at things that are published by the bank and so forth, you may get ideas of sources of funding. And it is even conceivable in some cases that because something co coincided very nicely with work that was going on at the bank that there would be interest in, particularly, say, funding data collection or something. It's not, it's not though, a, a kind of a, a main line of business that we have. Another place to look at, and, and since you're talking about Egypt, uh, this would be quite relevant to you. There is a, um, an organization which was actually created by the bank but is now independent of the bank called the Global Development Network. Uh, which is a um, consortium of researchers. And it happens that the, um, one of the offices for the Global Development Network is in Cairo. Um, so if you, if you kind of Google that and, and track it down to uh, the Cairo office is, is basically their kind of information systems um, locus, you might find if, if nothing else, they may have ideas about who's doing this kind of work or who would be interested in collaborating or who have data and that sort of thing. Yeah. One more. Yeah. Uh, many of the really uh, mm -hmm. um, I think that nowadays the GDP and GDP per capita is the most common meter for development. And uh, what can, yeah. are you thinking about uh, abandon or pushing uh, for the abandon of these uh, measures uh, in, to adopt the GDP? I 
I mean, are you well, so you're, so you're saying that the GDP measured in exchange rates is most commonly used, but are we are we thinking about using PPPs instead to evaluate GDP? I mean, we'd be looking at GDP in both cases, but one converting it from local currency using exchange rates, and the other using um, PPPs. And the answer is yes. We're seeing more instances where we should be using the PPP measure rather than the exchange rate measure. Um, but we're not going to completely give up one or the other. There may be circumstances where exchange rates are more appropriate. As an example, when we evaluate a country's ability to uh, debt, its debt carrying capacity, so, you know, how big a either debt stock it can support or how much does its, um, do its debt payments um, affect it? Uh, we tend to use exchange rates because, after all, if they're going to repay debt, they're going to repay debt using um, international currencies that are converted at market exchange rates. We can't sort of say, oh, actually, you know, my yuan is worth 50% more because it's a PPP yuan and then pay it to a Wall Street bank, which just doesn't work. So, um, so there's, there's a role for both. Uh, but we think in terms of, especially welfare measures, the PPP is much more relevant than the exchange rate measure.